जे अनिल प्रेम धाना करुणा प्रचु अनिल प्रेम धाना करुणा प्राचु हैं न प्रभु को था चार जठाकु हैं न प्रभु को था गेला चार जठाकु कहा मोरा स्वरूप रूपा कहा सनाता कहा मोर स्वरूप रूप कहा सनाता कहा दास रघु न था पति तो पावन कहा दास रघु न था पति तो कहा मोर भट जुगा कहा कबीरा कहा मोर भट जुगा कहा कबीराज का एक काल खो था केला गौरा न तरा एक खाल खोथा गेला गौरा न तरा
Pashane kuti bo mata anale pashiva Goranga gunera Nidhi kotha gele pavo Goranga gunera Nidhi kotha gele pavo Sheshaba Shangira Shange Jekoilo Bilas Sheshaba Shangira Shange Je koilo bilas She shangana paya kande naro tamadas Shri Sangana Paya Kande Naro Tamadas Kande Naro Tamadas Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare.
He who brought the treasure of divine love and who is filled with compassion and mercy, where has such a personality as Srinivas Acharya gone? Where are my Svarup Damodar and Rupa Goswami? Where is Sanatan? Where is Raghunath Das, the savior of the fallen? Where are my Raghunath Bhatta and Gopal Bhatta and where is Krishna Das Kaviraj? Where did Lord Goranga, the great dancer, suddenly go? I will smash my head against a rock and enter into fire. Where will I find Lord Goranga, the reservoir of all wonderful qualities? Being unable to obtain the association of Lord Goranga accompanied by all of these devotees, in whose association he performed his pastimes, Narottam Das simply weeps. So today is the disappearance day of Sri Gopal Bhatta Goswami. So we'll read about him from the Vaishnav Samadhi's book written by, compiled by Mahanidhi Swami. Sri Gopal Bhatta Goswami, the son of a Venkata Bhatta and of Sorry, the son of Venkata Bhatta, a Sri Vaishnava Brahmana, appeared in Sri Rangam, South India. Lord Chaitanya once stayed four months in his home and converted the family to Gaudiya Vaishnavism. A mere boy at this time, Gopal personally served the Lord. Sri Chaitanya treated him affectionately, giving his remnants and blessings to become an Acharya. During his four month stay, Lord Chaitanya developed a close friendship with Venkata Bhatta, which Krishnas Kaviraj describes as Sakyaras. Freely conversing with each other, they would often laugh and joke together. One day, in a humorous mood, Lord Chaitanya asked Venkata, Why does your worshipable goddess of why does your worshipable goddess of fortune, Sri Lakshmi Devi, abandon the happiness of Aikunta and her service to her Lord Narayana? Why does she go to Vrindavan and perform severe austerities to attain the association of my Lord Gopal, the cowherd boy of Raj? I can't understand these mysteries, said Venkata, but you, being the supreme personality of Godhead himself, can surely enlighten me. Lord Krishna has one unique quality, said Lord Goranga. He attracts the hearts of everyone with his personal conjugal love, Madhurya. Lord Narayana only has 60 transcendental qualities, but Sri Krishna has 64, and all of them are saturated with his unique quality of Madhurya, honey sweetness. The, per, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, attracts the minds of Lakshmi Devi, but Lord Narayana can never attract the minds of the Vraja Gopis. In Vraj Lila, Krishna, disguised as Lord Narayana, once appeared before the Gopis who were searching for Krishna. Seeing Lord Narayana, the Gopis said, O oh Lord Narayana, Pranams, where did Krishna go? Did you see? By following the Gopis, who spontaneously love Krishna without awareness of his Godhood, one can attain Krishna. The Shrutis worshipped Krishna in the ecstasy of the gopis. Following in their footsteps, they received gopis' bodies to join Krishna in the rasa dance. Lakshmi, however, wanted to enjoy Krishna but retain her spiritual form as Lakshmi Devi. Without following the gopis' footsteps, no one can attain Krishna. After receiving initiation from Sri Prabodhananda Saraswati, Gopal Bhatta came to Vrindavan and became a dear friend of Sri Rupa and Sanatana Goswamis. He did bhajan in Vrindavan for 45 years, mostly at Radha Kund. On pilgrimage, he obtained 12 Shalagram Shilas. Later, the Damodar Shila manifested himself as the beautiful Radha Ramana deity. Since 1542, Radha Ramanaji has been worshipped with pure devotion following precise Shastric rituals. Lord Chaitanya offered Gopal Bhatta to write so I ordered Gopal Bhatta to write a book to check the spread of pseudo-loving rasas and negligence to Vaithi Bhakti. In corroboration with Sri Sanatana Goswami, he compiled Hari Bhakti Vilas. Sorry, collaboration. In collaboration. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. In collaboration with Sri Sanatana Goswami, he compiled Hari Bhakti Vilas, the authorized book explaining the ritual and devotional practices of the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya. He also wrote Shat Kriya Deepika and the outline for Sri Jiva Goswami's Shat Sandarbhas. He eternally serves Srimati Radharani as one of her Ashtamandris, Gunamandri. His samadhi is within Radha Ramanji's temple compound behind the appearance place of the deity. Sri Gopal Bhatta Goswami initiated Gopinath Pujari Goswami, a lifelong brahmachari who served Radha Ramanji for his whole life. 
Gopal Bhattaka Swami initiated Srinivas Acharya and many other stalwart Vaishnavas. Sri Gopal Bhattaka Swami Ki Jai. So if anybody else has anything to add about Gopal Bhattaka Swami. Okay, then we'll move on to the Srimad Bhagavatam. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, Canto 5, chapter 20, text number 18. So it's prose. For the sake of time, should we just skip the Sanskrit? Okay. Oh, please. Tata. <laughs> Tatagwato dad by he crowned chat vipo, dvigona, somane na chiro, dena, pareta upaclipto, vito yata, kusha dvipo, kuto dena, yasmin, crowncho, nama, parvata rajo, dvipa nama, nevartaka aste. Okay, so translation. Outside the ocean of clarified butter is another island known as Crownchadvip which has a width of 1.6 million yojanas, 12.8 million miles, twice the width of the ocean of clarified butter. As Kushadweep is surrounded by an ocean of clarified butter, Kraunchadweep is surrounded by an ocean of milk, as broad as the island itself. On Kraunchadweep, there is a great mountain known as Kraunchah, from which the island takes its name. So I'll read a few verses. Although the vegetables living on the slopes of Mount Kraunsha were attacked and devastated by the weapons of Kartikeya, the mountain has become fearless because it is always bathed on all sides by the ocean of milk and protected by Varunadev. The ruler of this island was another son of Maharaj Priyavata. His name was Ghritaprishta, and he was a very learned scholar. He also divided his own island among his seven sons. After dividing the island into seven parts, named according to the names of his sons, Kritaprishta Maharaj completely retired, retired from family life and took shelter at the lotus feet of the Lord, the soul of all souls, who has all auspicious qualities. Thus he attained perfection. The sons of Maharaj Kritaprishta were named Ama, Madhuruha, Meghaprishta, Sudhama, Brajashta, Lohitarna, Sorry, Lohitarna and Vanaspati. In their island there are seven in their island there are seven mountains which indicate the boundaries of the seven tracts of land. And there are also seven rivers. The mountains are named Shukla, Vardhamana, Pojana, Ubabarhina, Nanda, Nandana, and Sarvatobhadra. The rivers are named Abhaya, Amritaugha, Aryaka, Tirtavati, Rupavati, Pavitravati, and Shukla. The inhabitants of Kraunchadweep are divided into four castes, called the Purushas, Rishabhas, Dravarnas, and Devakas. Using the waters of those sanctified rivers, they worship the personality of Godhead by offering a palmful of water at the lotus feet of Varuna, the demigod who has, uh, sorry, yeah, the demigod who has a form of water. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, "Yeah, sorry, purport." Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, "Apomaya asmayam." With joined palms, the inhabitants of the various sections of Kraunchadweep offer the sanctified waters of the rivers to a deity made of stone or iron. Um, next text, last one, text 23. Translation, the inhabitants of Kraunchadweep worship with this mantra, O water of the rivers, you have obtained energy from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, you purify the three planetary systems known as Bhuloka, Bhuvarloka, and Svarloka. By your constitutional nature, you take away sins, and that is why we are touching you. Kindly continue to purify us. Purport. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Bhumirapana lo vayu kamano buddhirevacha ahankara iti yamme bhinna prakatirashtada. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and false ego. All together, these eight comprise my separated material energies. Energy of the Lord acts, th sorry, the energy of the Lord acts throughout the creation just as heat and light. The energies of the sun act within the universe and make everything work. 
The specific rivers mentioned in the Shastras are also energies of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and people who regularly bathe in them are purified. It can be actually sorry, it can actually be seen that many people are cured of diseases simply by bathing in the Ganges. Similarly, the inhabitants of Crown Chatri purify themselves by bathing in the rivers there. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Shreshtam Manamapi Shachi Putra Matra Swarupam Rupam Tasyagrajam Murupurim Mathurim Goshtavatim Radha Kundam Giriparamaho Radhika Madhavasham Prapto Yasya Pratita Kripaya Shri Gurum Tamnatosmi Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yutapadakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamsha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitamsha He Krishna Kuruna Sindho Dina Bandho Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavane Shuri Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpadarubyascha Krapasin Hubi Evacha Patita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namonamaha Jai Shri Krishna Jaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So, uh, this chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam is a very well-known chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, namely because for a lot of devotees, uh, it could be a test of uh, one's faith um, in Krishna consciousness. Because the descriptions, um, they're very interesting. In if you compare them to uh, what we're taught, what we're indoctrinated with um, from a very young age in our uh, schooling systems, and, and just how this um, civilization now is putting so much emphasis on science, and I'll get to that. But I one point that. Um, I appreciate, um, or I, I appreciated when I read this chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And also just the fifth, yeah, the fifth canto, but then also, I particularly also had this, this, this realization when I was reading the, the chapter talking about the, the war between the demons and the demigods. That's the, is that the sixth canto? Or is that the, that's the eighth canto. That's the eighth canto. So in the eighth canto, anyway, I won't get into it, but there's this whole description about um, the de the demigods and the demons churning the ocean of milk, and then Kurma comes and he and they're churning it with Vasuki, this giant snake, and then they're and then the, the the actual thing they're using they're, they're using to churn is 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 this huge mountain, Mandra Mountain, and then it starts sinking into the ocean of milk. So Kurma comes, Lord Vishnu comes in the form of a tortoise, and uh, and he, he supports them under a mountain on his back so that they could churn it. And then all these things start coming out of the ocean, you know, Serbi cow, and, and it's, anyway, so many things. And then eventually this huge war breaks out on the banks of the ocean of milk, um, you know, on the shore. And then all these demigods are, and demons are killing each other, but they drank this nectar. So their body parts didn't die. So there was arms, you know, on the, on the battlefield that were still trying to fight. And there were severed heads. You know, they were still, and then there was, um, you know, there was like, there was like bodies and they were still trying to shoot arrows, you know, despite the fact that their, their heads were cut off. So anyway, super far out, super far out description. Um, so I was appreciating how um, the Srimad Bhagavatam gives us such a broad perspective of the universe. Um, all of these amazing things are going on. Um, you know, people nowadays, people in general, just they have knowledge of what? They have knowledge of, you know, maybe they're, at least, you know, they have knowledge of their hometown. They have knowledge of, you know, where they're living. They have knowledge of, you know, the, their country, the politics that are going on. They'll have, um, people have some, some knowledge of world politics. But, um, 
one who sincerely studies the Srimad Bhagavatam um, submissively can can have such a broad perspective of what's going on in the universe. I mean, this whole crazy thing is going on, you know, these, these struggles between the demigods and the demons. And the people on this planet just have no idea. They're just going about their day. They think, they think that this world is the all in all. Um, and then similarly, we're hearing now about um, Maharaj Guttaprishta and Maharaj Priyavrata and all these different um, islands and um, yeah, the entire structure of the universe, how their society is structured. We're hearing that there's the Purushas, Rishabhas, Dravinas, and Devakas, uh, the different castes on the different planets. So um, even on a material level, one who reads the Srimad Bhagavatam, their, their, um, their perspective becomes so broadened, not just to this world, but to the higher planets, the lower planets, etc. So, but uh, like I said, it does sound strange. I think anybody, um, practically anybody who's raised in the West, this chapter kind of like, I mean, and not even just in the West, actually. I mean, practically anybody who's raised outside, even a little bit outside of Vedic culture, um, this chapter, you kind of like hear like, you know, ocean of milk and it's kind of like, ooh. Um, because, you know, we're so used to, I mean, just from, from such a young age, I mean, from, you know, when we're little kids, we're taught, you know, science is fact. What, whatever we call science is fact. Whatever, um, you know, we've discovered is fact. And people, um, they like to um, tout their own abilities and understanding things. Um, they like to think that, well, I only believe what I can see. I only believe what I can know. I only believe what I can perceive with my mind and my senses. Okay, fine. Um, we don't agree, but okay, fine. If you want to, even if, even if you ex we accept, okay, that you think that and that, that you really um, are, are, you only believe what you see. Um, there's still so many problems with that, actually, because... Uh, for one, how much can you see? How much can you see? Um, and by that logic, we should expect that everybody who's a follower of science, everybody who, who um, says science is the absolute truth, then they should recreate all of the major experiments that have led to uh, the scientific knowledge that we've come to today because otherwise they haven't experienced it and otherwise they can't accept it as truth. But that's impossible. You can't expect everybody, you can't expect everybody to recreate all of the major experiments that science has gone through to get to the knowledge that it's come to now. You can't expect anybody to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't expect anybody to do it. Um, so um, it comes down to an issue of epistemology. Epistemology meaning how you know what you know. So in um, Nyai, or um, you could say Vedic knowledge, Vedic uh, debate or logic, there's three primary forms of evidence, uh, or called pramana. Um, one is pratyaksha, which is direct sense perception, perception by the mind and senses. There's anuman, which is inference. And there's shabda, which means hearing from a reliable source. So people like to think that they are only, um, that they're very, you know, very rational and very, um, you know, reasonable. And so I only accept pratyaksha and anuman. I only, you know, accept what I can see, what I can perceive, and also what I can infer. But that's not true. It's just not true. Um, because most people will never look into the Hubble telescope. Most people will never look into all of the different science experiments that are being performed and, and that have been performed in the past. What they do is they hear from scientists who have done these experiments and they say, okay, I trust you. So actually, what they're accepting is not production or anuman, they're accepting shabda. They're accepting um, what you could call knowledge in disciplic succession. But then it comes down to Who's the authority? Who's the real authority? Um, and Jiva Goswami in his Tattva Sandarbha, the first of his Shat Sandarbhas, 
uh, he gives a really amazing analysis of who is the authority. So the first, um, you could say, step of his argument is that the jiva is not the authority, that the conditioned souls in this material world are not the authority because they have four primary defects. Brahma, illusion, I have it in my notes. Yeah, pramada, tendency to make mistakes, deception, or tendency to cheat others, zirpalipsa, and imperfect senses, uh, karnapatava. So, one who has, nobody can deny that these four defects are there. Nobody can deny that people have a tendency to become illusion. Of course, the primary illusion is to think that, you know, the body is not, or the, that the body is the self. Um, so, just based on that, everybody is disqualified in this material world, practically speaking. Um, no one can deny that humans have a tendency to make mistakes. Srila Jiva Goswami, um, he explains that the tendency to make mistakes is when the mind and the senses are not focused on the same object. So, for example, if I'm looking at Tyler, but my mind is somewhere else, I may miss something, some aspect of his form. I may miss his, I don't know, the, his strings on his hoodie or something like that, you know. And then... Um, Tendency to cheat others, that's, everybody knows that's there, even as, I, I almost want to say, especially within science, there's a tendency to cheat others because there's so much money involved and fame involved in science. Um, and then imperfect senses. Yeah, even, you know, our eyes, you know, like, for example, sorry, Jumuna Jeevan, but you're wearing glasses. So Jumuna Jeeva's eyes are imperfect, and I'm sorry also, Dr. Jean, your, your eyes are also imperfect. But, uh, Everybody's, everybody's senses are imperfect. There, nobody can deny that. So all of these things. So how can one be a perfect source of evidence if practically everything about the way he perceives the world and interacts with the world is imperfect? How is it possible? It's not. So Jiva Goswami, he um, explains that, a perfect, uh, that perfect evidence comes from a perfect source, namely a source which is above these four um, qualities of tendency to cheat, tendency to make mistakes, imperfect senses, and um, illusion. And then he goes on to describe the glories of the Srimad Bhagavatam and how the Srimad Bhagavatam is actually the perfect source of knowledge because it's coming from the trance of Vyasadeva, from Vyasadeva Samadhi. Um, it's not, it doesn't have human origin. The Srimad Bhagavatam is not written by humans. It was not, um, it, it didn't come from some guy's mind. It came from the trance of Vyasadeva and it was revealed to him after he had compiled all of the other Vedic literatures. In the first canon, it's described that, that uh, Srila Vyasadeva, he was feeling, he had, comp he had done everything. He compiled the Upanishads, he compiled the, the Mahabharata, which included the Bhagavad Gita, he compiled the Ramayana. Um, oh, sorry, that was Valmiki. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Um, but anyway, all the Vedic literatures, all the, all the other Puranas, um, etc. But still he was feeling dissatisfied. He was feeling like, like he hadn't really hit the mark. And so Narada Muni, his spiritual master, he, under he understood that, that Vyasadeva was feeling despondent. So he went to his ashram and he asked uh, Srila Vyasadeva, why are you feeling despondent? You've compiled all these, uh, or yeah, he asked him, why are you feeling despondent? despondent? And he said, well, you know, I've compiled all of these Vedic literatures, but still, for some reason, I, I, I don't feel like I've really hit the mark, you know? Something feels wrong. And he asked his spiritual master, what, what have I done wrong? And so then his, his spiritual master, Narada Muni, told him, he said, well, you've compiled all of these literatures, these great, great works, but you haven't compiled a literature which is wholly and solely dedicated to talking about and discussing and explaining the process of pure devotional service. So then um, Srila Vyasadeva said, you're right. And then he compiled the Srimad Bhagavatam. So this Srimad Bhagavatam is known as um, Nigama Kalpa Taror Galitam Palam meaning that it's the ripened fruit of the Vedic literature, and it was written by Vyasadeva in his maturity. So, um, it doesn't have a material source. It's not subject 
to cheating. Dharma Projet of Kaita Votra. In fact, it's completely dedicated to kicking out all forms of cheating religion, all forms of cheating Dharma. Um, so the Bhagavatam is the real evidence. The Bhagavatam is um, what we should be basing our lives upon. But unfortunately, due to illusion, uh, people are accepting the, the testimony of the scientists who are themselves slaves to their own mind and senses. And therefore, they can't know anything. And so somebody might accuse us, well, you know, you're saying that it's above the four defects. Okay, this isn't that. But it's saying things that are just too far out. I just, I can't accept that there's an ocean of ghee. I can't accept that there's an ocean of liquor, that there's an ocean of milk. And um, I just, I can't accept it. But if you look at what's being pushed in the name of science nowadays, they're also telling very bizarre stories. They're also telling um, what you could call fantasies. Like, for example, the fantasy of the Big Bang that billions and billions of years ago, there was nothing. And then there was an explosion because that makes sense that nothing can explode. And then there was something, there was the entire universe, all the laws of nature. And then, you know, a few billion years, Alakadab, you know, Alakadabra, Alakazam. And then now we're here sitting here discussing it. That's what they're pushing in the name of science. That's what they're pushing in the name of a comprehensive, very logical, very reasonable worldview. But um, it doesn't make any sense. And they may use big words. They may say, you know, say, oh, well, we looked in our telescopes. We saw, you know, the red shift and um, whatever other nonsense evidence that they have. And then they push it as truth. And if you say anything about it, anything that, 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 that might even suggest that you're against it, then you're completely, you're outcast, completely. You're, you're not taken seriously as a scientist. You're not taken seriously as, as just a, you know, a logical, rational person. And you're just, you're just some fringe kind of conspiracy theorist, um, you know, freak. And there was a scientist, a very famous scientist named, I think his name is Fred Hoyle. Or, yeah, Fred Hoyle. He was an Englishman. And he was very famous. He was knighted by the queen, became Sir Fred Hoyle. And one day he was looking, this is relatively recently, it was in the 20th century. Um, he was looking, you know, in his telescope and he was looking at the redshift. And one day he just said, no, this is not, this isn't evidence for the Big Bang. You know, it's just, it's not. And now his name in science is, is completely, syn it's synonymous with, with, being like nonsense, it's synonymous with being like, he was completely outcast, lost everything, his whole career, just because he said that the redshift is not evidence of the Big Bang. Amazing. This whole, the whole process of science nowadays, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's like a social process. It's not, it's not a scientific process, it's a social process. It's who's got the positions, who's got the money, who's got the, um, you know, the prestige, um, like this. And so Srila Prabhupada spoke a lot about these scientists. And, and, and common words, common term that he used for scientists was fools. Another one was rascals. So, um, therefore, we don't take so seriously um, the conclusions of the material scientists because they're actually not such, such serious conclusions if you really look into it. And so there's one... I'm not sure what he is. I think maybe he's a scientist or something like that. His name is Rupert Sheldrake. Um, but he, he gave a TED talk called, this is another example of, of, of um, Sada Puta Prabhu had a term for it. I forgot what it was. It's something like information bias or anyway, but basically his conclusion was that in science, there's a con, there's this, this idea that, confirmation bias or whatever it is, that, that there's this idea that we know essentially what the truth is, and so we only accept evidence, we only accept evidence as good evidence if it, you know, supports our conclusion. Um, so Rupert Sheldrake, he says, give us one free miracle, or he, sa he said that s science is saying, give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. The one free miracle is the appearance of all the mass and energy in the universe and all the laws that govern it in a single instant from nothing. 
So this is this is the this is the fantasy that they're that they're proposing that all of the laws, all the mass and energy in the universe, and all the laws that govern it came in a single instant from nothing. Um, and then he went on to say, "I am in favor. I am in all favor of scientists. Uh, sorry, of science and reason, if they are scientific and reasonable. But I am against granting scientists and the materialist worldview an exemption from critical thinking and skeptical investigation." So this is the state now of science, and it's pushed nowadays in schools um, to young children, very very early age, that science is truth or what we call science is truth. But real science is this Bhagavad philosophy. Real science comes from the Srimad Bhagavatam. Real science comes from the Vedic literatures because it can be subject to critical thinking. It can be subject to skeptical investigation. And it will pass all tests if you skeptically investigate it. Um, Prabhupada established um, when he was on the planet and continued after the Bhaktivedanta Institute, and they did such amazing work. They did such amazing work in, um, in, 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 in looking into a lot of these um, scientific matters, a lot of the measurements that are given in the Bhagavatam, a lot of the, um, you know, the structural kind of things, of the structure of the universe, particularly in this chapter, um, that was investigated by Saraputta Prabhu, uh, Srubhdhamara Goswami, and many other devotees. And if you listen to, you can listen to their talks. Sadhguru Prabhu has so many talks that he gave here in San Diego and in other places, talking about so many topics: evolution, structure of the universe. And it really, when you get down to it, makes a lot of sense. So, we should have faith in these descriptions of the Bhagavatam, um, because the Bhagavatam is real evidence. So one might offer the objection, okay, well, why study the universe anyway? The Bhagavatam is supposed to be a treatise on pure devotional service. Now, why are we even talking about the universe? Why are we talking about the different planets? Why are we talking about the different people on the planets? What's the point? And in the 12th canto, there's a verse, which is not exactly in relation to this, but it, the same concept can be applied. The verse is 12, 3, 14. Sorry, I should have found it before. Um. Yes. 12, 3, 14. Yes. Kata imaste, katita mahi, mahi yasam, vetaya lokesha yashafpare yusham, yusham. Vignana Vairagya Vivakshaya Vibho Vacho Vibhuti Natparamartyam Translation, Shukri Goswami is saying, um, O Maharaj Parikshit, I have related to you the narration of all these great kings who have spread their fame throughout the world and then departed. My real purpose was to teach transcendental knowledge and renunciation. Stories of kings lend power and opulence to these narrations, but do not in and of themselves constitute the ultimate aspect of knowledge. So the Srimad Bhagavatam, even when describing, um, you could say, apparently external things, like the Srimad Bhagavatam, it describes all of these narrations of kings, for example, Maharaj Priyavrata, Maharaj Gita Pururava, um, all these, you know, Prithu Maharaj, Rishabhadev, all these different kings. Um, one might say, okay, well, why, why hear about kings? Why hear about kings and how they rule their kingdoms and this and that? But the real purpose of Shukadeva Goswami was to teach knowledge and renunciation. The real significant part of teaching about these kings was the fact that they gave up their kingdom and surrendered to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, similarly, in, in, in studying the structure of the universe and studying all of these things about the material creation, the point is to teach about the glories of the Supreme Lord, to teach about how amazing, how powerful Krishna is. And so when we, we can hear about, you know, um, Krishna's glory, about, you know, his, uh, talking about his sweetness, talking about this, you know, his pastimes, and the Bhagavatam does get into that. But initially, 
<clears throat> the Bhagavatam, you have to approach Madhurya through Aishvarya. Meaning you have to approach Krishna's sweetness, Krishna's, Krishna's Leela and Vrindavan through um, things like, uh, th- through Aishwarya, through his opulence. So we have to first learn the glory of Krishna, learn the power of Krishna, learn that he's a great personality, that he's not just a little cowherd boy in Vrindavan who's enjoying with the gopis and who's herding cows. Because the tendency is that conditioned souls misunderstand things. So if we don't hear nine cantos talking about Krishna's glory, talking about Krishna as the supreme Lord, the supreme controller, then we'll misunderstand when the Bhagavatam speaks about Krishna as uh, a little boy in the arms of his mother or, or, or a little boy who's throwing a temper tantrum because his mother won't breastfeed him or a little boy who goes into the houses of, of the, you know, the, the, the elder gopis in Vrindavan and steals butter and milk and urinates on the floor with his brother Balaram and, and just causes a ruckus. We'll misunderstand we could, because that's the tendency of conditioned souls. We misunderstand. So to hear about the material creation, to hear about how it all happens, it's, it's meant to bring us to an understanding of Krishna's glory, Krishna's greatness, Krishna's aishvarya. And it enhances, when, when, and then when we get to the 10th canto, it, it enhances the, uh, the sweetness or the inconceivability of Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan. There's a verse in the Brahma Samhita, Advaita Machyuta Manadi Mananta Rupam Adyam Purana Purusham Navayova Namcha Vede Shud... No, no. No, 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 that's, that's the one, but I'm, I'm thinking of a different verse. Um, what's the one? Navayova Namcha. Really? Vede Shudur Lavamadur Lavamatma Bhakto. No, it's, it's a different one. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Adhyam Purana Purusham Navayovna. Okay, so that's the right one. Vede Shudur Lavamadur Lavamatma Bhakto Govindam Adi Purusham Tamaham Bajami. So this verse is saying that Krishna, he's, he's inconceivable, he's, he's unlimited, he appears in unlimited forms, he's, um, he's the original um, Purusha, he's the original creator, the first living being, um, and everything rests on him. And he's completely um, in, you know, inconceivable through just, studying the Vedic, or, yeah, through just studying the Vedic literatures. But amazingly, Inconceivably, he's appearing as a fresh youth in Vrindavan, a cowherd boy in Vrindavan whose pastimes are so sweet. So who, who, can, who can fathom that the Lord of the universe, who's being served by you know, millions of Lakshmi Devis, who is the controller of, of millions of universes, millions of universes just, just, just from his breathing, they come from the pores of his skin, entire universes. But still, he's appearing as a little cowherd boy in Vrindavan, who's, who's being chastised by his mother, who's being controlled by the love of his friends, by the love of, his, uh, by the, love of the gopis. It's inconceivable. So, although we're hearing about things which may seem external, which may seem material, if we see it as linked with Krishna, then we're seeing it in the right way. Then we'll be able to really appreciate it. Because everything that's included in the Bhagavatam is meant for a purification. It's not that um, there's things in the Bhagavatam that are unnecessary or that are, you know, not, not important. All of them are important. There's varying degrees of importance. Like there's different things that we emphasize. Like, for example, in the ninth canto. Ninth canto is practically just a giant list of names. But we go through it and we, you know, we don't have to memorize them or anything like that. But we go through and we offer respects to these great personalities. And... You know, we hear their names, we chant their names for purification. And that's it. And, and it brings us closer to Krishna. Everything in the Bhagavatam is meant to bring us closer to Krishna. Um, so if we go through these descriptions with that in mind, understanding the glory of Krishna and understanding that hearing about the glories of Krishna um, purifies us and brings us closer to him, then we'll have proper understanding. So I'll stop there. It's a little bit late. But then we can have questions and comments. Yes. Just a small comment. 
I was distributing books one time, and I met one person who heard about Krishna, hadn't read up to the all the way up to the ninth canto. He said, "Oh yeah, you guys are the guys that believe that God is a little blue boy." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Didn't read up to the ninth canto. <laughs> yeah. So he's a little bit more than that. It just <laughs> When I first came here in 89, um, the first book I worked on was Sadhaputta's book, Vedic Cosmography and Cosmology, I think it's called, called, which exactly deals with the fifth canto. If you want to understand more of what this is, and kind of because your head can get swimming all these oceans and the names and the rivers, uh, it, it's, it's very uh, wonderful how he, does, how he describes it and he relates it and how... Uh, you know, it, it makes it it makes it more understandable for Western minds. Vedic cosmography and cosmology, I think it's called. I have a copy at home, and it's also on Kindle. And I have to I have to beg to differ about the list of names in the ninth canon because you have Ambarish Maharaj, which is important. You have a nice summary of Lord Ram's Leela. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's a lot. Par- Parasharam is in there. So it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was I was just speaking because I mean there's there's some there's some chapters where it's just like it seems like it goes on and on. And there's on. a lot of yeah. About, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. The verse at the end about Krishna's face. Yes, yana nam makuta kunda the chauru karna brajat kapoda sabagang sabalasa hasam nityot sabam the tatapuj to be babanjo na yo na rasta madita kupitasta meista. This is Christian Makata Kunda that describes how he's got these the, the, the uh, earrings, like these shark shaped earrings. And then it says, uh, and it, both the men and the women of, of Vrindavan are always drinking the, the nectar of Krishna's face and they're never satiated. And that's like, a, you know, it gets you ready for the tenth canto. A few verses later, you're in the tenth canto. Yeah. Yeah, the tenth, the tenth canto is a nice payoff after <laughs> reading the ninth canto. Yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, two comments. Please. One, uh, recently I was listening to a lecture by Brahman Pad Swami, and uh-huh. he was describing descending knowledge and ascending knowledge. So your lecture just kind of ties it all together. But a good example he gave was like, as ascending knowledge, as we progress through the education system, we hear from many different teachers, and they're all full of you know, uh, opinions and yeah. versions of the knowledge. So really, ascending knowledge is you know, uh, not reliable. Yeah. Descending knowledge coming from Krishna, Vyasadeva through Bhagavatam, it never changes. Yeah. And so it's solid and it's most reliable. So the ascending and descending. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good, that's, yeah, that's a nice, that's a nice example. Yeah, also because we, we literally just cannot understand transcendental knowledge just by our, like, mundane sense. Even, even, even hearing about it from, from, reliable sources even even from hearing about it from the acharyas we still can't understand it um fully until our senses are purified so yeah the to to think like people say you know oh well you know we looked in our telescopes we looked in our microscopes we uh you know we uh we did some surveys and we didn't find god so he's not there um but what what senses what ability do you have to perceive god um and what do you accept as evidence? Um, and then, of course, we put forth that the real evidence is descending knowledge from Krishna in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And then my other comment, if I can, real yes. quick. I was watching uh, Carl Sagan, actually, in the, from the 70s, as an astro- uh, astronomer. Mm-hmm. He has a video series, and there's one video where he actually talks about Vedic astronomy, mm. and he gives, a lot of, he gives it a lot of credit. And he actually covers Vishnu uh, ex- breathing expansion and contraction of the universe yeah. and he talks about this uh, and it's pretty amazing that Carl Sagan is very popular yeah, you know, yeah. world-renowned yeah. world-renowned but it's a uh, someone said you know but someone of these big scientists uh, actually did touch on this this abstract idea yeah. of expansion and contraction I think Carl Sagan was the one who who said that he appreciated the Vedic um, conception because its numbers I mean, what he said was that its numbers were the closest to what we have, or to what you know they have. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Hare Krishna, Prabhu, just to let you know, there is one question pending on the Zoom. Okay, Balar and Prabhu has something, then we'll move to the Zoom. 
Yeah, I was just thinking because sometimes devotees they um, they may take you know because we have this whole because we have the process of prayer also right? yeah it's like a whole nother it's a bit different from what we're discussing but process of prayer because you say okay well how am I supposed to get direction how am I supposed to and then they say oh well pray right so it is there but we have to be careful about that yeah. Um, because anyways, I just heard recently, <laughs> um, Bhakti Vikash Swami, he was trying to guide this devotee, um, you know, through email, this and that, and she was wanting to take some guidance from him. So he was <coughs> trying to guide her and then she was from Europe and then she was saying, Maharaj, well, you know, what, what should I do? You know, I have some more time with my life. I, you know, what, what should I do? And he said, well, maybe you should dedicate more of your time to book distribution. So then, um, so then she, then, uh, so that's what Mara said to her. Mm. So then she responded and she said, and she, first of all, she didn't like that, what he said, but she said, I resp uh, she responded and she said, I prayed to Srila Prabhupada about this, you know, you, you wanted me to do book distribution, dedicate my life to book distribution. I prayed to Srila Prabhupada, and what he told me to do is he told me I should kick you in the head. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, he, he, you know, so it's, uh, I mean, did Prabhupada, you know, anyways, it's, you, you understand, but. Now, the, of course, this is an extreme. Yeah, yeah. This is an extreme. <clears throat> But she took it seriously. She wasn't yeah. like, this is an extreme. But still, I mean, you could, you know, lesser degrees. We have to be careful about that. Yeah. We, we pray to Prabhupada and, okay, we may get some inspiration, but is it coming from Prabhupada or is it coming from something else? Yeah. So you have to be careful. Yeah. But I was wondering if you could give some inference, right? Yeah. If you could give some, could you give us some examples? Of inference. Yeah. Well, like for example, I think I think Jiva Goswami gives gives this example. Um, I think um, so. The example is that behind a mountain, um, you see smoke coming from behind a mountain. Therefore, you say, "Okay, it's fire." There's a fire behind the mountain. That's your conclusion. And you can infer that because wherever there's smoke, there's fire. Um, that behind the mountain, there's fire. But it could also be that there was fire, but then rain, you know, the rain put it out. And so the, there's still smoke. Or it could be... Um, smoke machine. Yeah, smoke machine, yeah. <laughs> exactly. There could be a rock concert going on behind the moon. Um, so, like that. Like, inference, inference can't really give us conclusive knowledge because it could mean so many, like, it could mean so many things. There's smoke coming from behind a mountain. We can't come to a serious conclusion because there's so many different things that it could be. Another example of inference. Yeah, I mean, it's it's going to be like, similar. yeah, similar things. Yeah. And what about this? And what about descending knowledge? Because we accept this principle of descending knowledge mm. in Krishna consciousness, but the materialist, they also accept descending knowledge. But, yeah, they accept, but it's not transcendental, obviously. Yeah, I mean, they, they don't only accept ascending knowledge. They do accept ascending knowledge for, I mean, basically the, the, the foundational principles of their understanding of the world is descending knowledge. They also come to other conclusions, you know, come to conclusions from other ways as well. But they, the thing is they say, you know, we have, you know, our, 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 our view of the world is based on logic and reason and, and what we can see and what we can understand. But it's not because the vast majority of people can't see and can't understand these conclusions that the scientists have come to. Um, even, if, even if they got a chance to look into the Hubble telescope. They haven't tested them out. They yeah. Even if, even if they had a chance to look into the Hubble telescope, what could they understand? You know, what could they understand from the data that's coming from, you know, it even, it even takes years and like so much, you know, education just to, just to be able to interpret the data that's coming from these scientific instruments. Yeah. Yeah, they're trusting them, they're putting their faith in them. And that's the whole thing, you know. And it's the same thing with like evolution, for example. Nobody can actually, nobody can see evolution happening. 
um, at least not evolution in the sense that like, you know, life came from chemicals and nobody, and nobody can, nobody can actually like, you know, reproduce it or test it out. It's a theory. It's completely theoretical. It, it just exists inside the mind. So they're accepting that completely on faith. But then they say that we're very reasonable. We don't accept anything on faith. Um, yeah. Okay, I think we have something on Zoom. Uh, Amoga Prabhu? Yes, Vijay Krishna Prabhu. Uh, Danda, uh, Danda Pranams Prabhu. My question is, is it accurate to say that bathing in the ocean has the same pu purificatory effect as bathing in the Ganges? After all, all the rivers on this planet, even the sacred ones, eventually end up depositing their waters into the oceans. Isn't it so? And yes. more than that, isn't that the ocean is the representative of Krishna among the bodies of water? Yes, that's true. And that's why whenever we go into the ocean, we first touch the water to our head before we touch it with our feet. And then we bathe. So... Yeah, bathing in the ocean is very purifying. Now, I don't know if it's exactly, I guess I haven't heard anybody say that it's more purifying than bathing in the Ganga um, because the Ganga and all the other you know, holy rivers deposit into it. But I do know that it is purifying and I do know that the ocean is uh, holy and sacred and that we respect it um, very much. Yes, Prabhu, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Very, very nice class. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Thank jai. you. Hare Krishna. Grantaraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Shruti Pratakshamaya.